I want to begin by introducing uh, Ms. Neshwat. She is currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Implementation in the Bureau of Energy Resources, where she, she has served since October 2011. Previously, she was Senior Advisor and Chief of Staff to the Special Envo Envoy for Eurasian Energy. Immediately prior to that, she's also served as the Energy Policy Advisor in the Department's Economic Bureau, where she focused on energy security issues for Europe and Central Asia. In 2010 to 2011, and this was including the period following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, Ms. Neshwat served as a Council on Foreign Relations Fellow in Japan, where she conducted energy and economic policy research evaluating U.S. and Asian energy policies. That wasn't enough. <laughs> Earlier in her career, Ms. Neshawat was Chief of Staff of Policy and Planning at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, where she worked on international energy security issues, including nuclear power and non-proliferation issues. She's also served on the U.S. Presidential Commission on Intelligence Capabilities regarding weapons of mass destruction, where she led the North Korea Policy Steering Committee. A former U.S. military, for, excuse me, a former U.S. Army military intelligence officer, she served consecutive tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, Ms. Neshwat, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're so pleased to have each and every one of you here today um, at the Department of State as we also celebrate War World Energy Day and National Energy Action Month. Um, today we want to focus a little bit on clean energy initiatives um, here in the U.S. as well as internationally. Um, I, as my introducer said, I'm, I'm with the Bureau of Energy Resources and it was, it's fairly new. We're now in our second year of operation. And basically, this was in response to our quadrennial diplomacy and development uh, review to basically identify and assess diplomatic and progr programmatic um, efforts on energy resources, uh, governance issues, especially in the face of a changing global, global market. Um, as many of you know, the, uh, the world is indeed amidst of a global energy revolution. And for the first time ever, energy demand is being led by developing countries outside of the OECD. We're also seeing a revolution in supply, uh, the development of unconventional energy here in North America, um, as well as these shifts, um, seeing uh, basically a, a, a dramatic impact um, on the world's energy landscape. And we're going to get to some of those questions shortly. But I just want to highlight real quickly, uh, the energy sector here in the U.S. is going through, certainly going through a renaissance as new technologies and innovations shape the market. Uh, we're becoming much more energy self-sufficient um, due to dramatic increases in the production of clean natural gas, for example, advancements in energy efficiency, and new investments in renewables and nuclear power. We're reducing emissions um, while incre increasing production of domestic energy resources, and that does include oil and gas, um, as well as renewables. In fact, in 2012, uh, carbon dioxide emissions from the energy sector fell to the lowest levels in almost two decades. That same year, U.S. net oil imports fell to the lowest, I'm sorry, did fall to the lowest in 20 years, but also we became the world's leading producer um, of natural gas. So part of this is a result of doubling America's deployment of uh, energy sources such as wind, solar, geothermal uh, energy and increasing demand side of energy efficiency, which we'll, again, we'll talk about in a little bit. So, and we also look at the establishment of the toughest fuel economy standards, um, basically in our history, uh, while also trying to create jobs and boosting our economy, uh, building new industries and reducing, again, dangerous carbon pollution that contributes to climate change. Uh, today, our panel here will take a look at some of the domestic policies and impl implementation of alternative and renewable energy uh, technologies that spurred the rapid growth in the energy sector and assesses challenges uh, as well as opportunities for continued progress in the years ahead. So I'm joined today by uh, U.S. clean energy experts from both the public and private sector. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Todd Foley, who is our Senior Vice President of Policy and Government Relations at ACOR, which is the American Council on Renewable Energy. Uh, ACOR is a nonprofit uh, dedicated to building a secure and prosperous America with clean renewable energy by providing an educational platform, uh, convening thought leadership forums, forging partnerships, and communicating the benefits of renewable energy. 
Second is J.C. Sandberg. He is the Director of Global Government Affairs and Policy for Renewables at GE. And lastly, uh, Jonathan Pershing, who before joining the Department of Energy as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Change Policy and Technology, was here in Foggy Bottom as the U.S. Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change. Uh, Dr. Pershing is widely recognized for his work on international climate change architecture, including the creation of a post-Kyoto Protocol climate change environment. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'll open up with a few questions, and each of you can speak, and then uh, there will be a couple that I will uh, orientate uh, specifically to uh, your uh, portfolios. The first question I'd like to pose um, is really just to talk about what we're experiencing, as I mentioned earlier, this energy revolution, um, with, particularly with developing nations that is spurring much of the demand for energy. Uh, we look at the Western Hemisphere, for example, driving production of oil and natural gas. How do you all see this uh, changing both the domestic and global energy landscape overall? Um, and Jonathan, if you want, would like to start first, that'd be fine. <coughs> Sure. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Julia, and it's also a great pleasure to be back at the State Department. I, I enjoy the chances to have a chat with people who are working on the international side. I'm devoting a lot of my time right now to domestic policy, so it's useful to have both pieces come back in. Uh, and in some sense, it's actually fitting to have a question like this here at the State Department, because the structure is very much an international one. The United States, in fact, has seen a relatively flat picture in its own energy demand. Uh, the growth has been very much a global growth. And in fact, if you take a look at it, uh, some of the key emerging economies are the places that we would tend to focus. So if you think about where China was, I began doing, for example, the climate change negotiations uh, in 1989. And at that point, China was less than one-tenth the size of the United States. And its energy was commensurately small. And if you take a look at it now, Chinese emissions by 2020 are projected to be twice as large as those of the US. So you just think about the rate of growth that's associated with the rate of demand of power, demand for transport, demand across the board for energy services. It's not a bad thing. It also comes with development. It comes with a better quality of life. It comes with the welfare benefits that attach to energy provision and supply. And to me, the question really is not so much as where the growth coming from and where's the supply coming from, but how do you manage it? And at the moment, we're having a hard time managing it. Some countries have done pretty well. The United States isn't too bad. We've actually got relatively clean air. We've got relatively clean water. It comes when the power goes on, and you don't really have to think about it. You go to China, and you've all seen the pictures. You go to Indonesia, and you've seen the pictures in Jakarta. Some of you live in these places. You go to some of the cities, and they remind you of what Los Angeles was in the 1970s, but a factor of 10 worse, because they have a factor of 10 more people. Those kinds of dynamics are driving us at the local level and the global level, and they offset the benefits of increased coal, increased oil, increased gas, and even some of the increases in renewable power that we're all striving to promote as part of a clean energy picture. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> I'm Todd Foley with ACOR. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, good, to, good to see everybody, and, and you, Jonathan, especially, as well, uh, as we've uh, talked uh, about a lot of these domestic and international issues here in India and, and, and domestically. Um, I, I would just add uh, to, to what Jonathan uh, is saying, and that is that uh, there is tremendous excitement about, you know, about energy generally uh, due to the, the, the tremendous uh, progress we've seen in technology. And I mean technology across even for the extraction industries, when you think of oil and gas, you think about fracking and other things that are on, on opening up access to all kinds of new uh, areas that previously weren't uh, either available or economic. I would just add, however, as, as much uh, as gas and oil development is in the news and, <clears throat> and there's excitement about it, uh, we're equally as excited about what's happening in renewable energy. The technology progress and the progress we've seen across our sector is, it, I would even argue, is even more exciting. We've seen in the last five years a tremendous uh, cost reduction in solar and wind and the other technologies, and this is, this is changing everything. You know, we've seen solar costs come down 80% in the last five years. We've seen wind come down 40% uh, over the last five years. The good news is that's going to continue because we see there's lots of room uh, for continued cost reduction, especially since these costs have, have come down before we've actually truly scaled up. Renewable energy is still, mo in most places around the world, a small portion of overall power supply, but it's growing fast. So we've got tremendous uh, opportunity to grow that going forward. And I think it actually portends really you know, good things for no, not only here in the U.S., but internationally in the developing world. Uh, because uh, there is, uh, 
as, a, as we know, there, as, the, as the other countries around the world develop, as the economies progress, uh, we're gonna need more and more energy. Uh, the good news is these, these renewable energy technologies are cost competitive with conventional sources. And in fact, let's say here in the US, uh, in areas in the Midwest, uh, wind is being bid in cheaper than natural gas. Uh, look what many Americans doing in the Midwest. In the, some of the Southwest states, solar is being bid in than everything else, including coal and natural gas. So these technologies are cost competitive. And as, as, uh, as we go forward, I think they can play uh, even a much greater role uh, going forward. So I think it's a, and this is all a reflection of a number of key drivers that have uh, taken place in the market. You know, we've seen these, uh, the renewable energy companies very much focus on improving their products and services, reducing costs, coming at it from every direction imaginable to get overall costs of these systems down. But we've also seen this as a result of some good policy. You know, here in the U.S., for the last number of years, we've had, a, a, I think, a, in the renewable energy space, a great example of federalism, mm -hmm. where we have important uh, tax credits, I think, that most of us know about, ITC and PTC, which have been a, important motivators of capital and investment here, complemented by a number of state renewable energy standards. So you have a demand signal at the state level, and you have some important uh, fiscal uh, instruments that help lower the cost of systems. And this is what has enabled us to scale up renewable energy development here in the U.S., coupled with what the industry has been doing, help lower costs dramatically. And I think just going forward here in the U.S., uh, we're at this uh, point where we do need to think about where we go from here. We've had years of experience on, on the tax credits and the RPSs, you know, what's next? I think on the international side, it's truly a global market, a global industry, that this cost reduction that's taken place that we benefited from here in the U.S. is also uh, evident elsewhere around the world. In fact, in some places like Germany, led there. So uh, these are, this pretends really great stuff for the future, especially renewables. So whereas, uh, there's a, a energy transformation taking place, but renewables, I think, are very much part of that. Thank you. I would, I would build on that, and I would say from uh, a manufacturing perspective, so from a general electric perspective, I think that um, the U.S. continues to be, um, with the exception of 2013, where we kind of had boom bust with the production tax credit, continues to be one of the biggest markets in the world, especially when we say GE renewables, we're talking mainly about wind and some solar. Um, mm -hmm. Solar kind of suffers from oversupply and really kind of f super hyper-focused markets, I think, as Todd mentioned. So when... when if from the wind perspective, I think that we've seen kind of this uncertainty surrounding the production tax credit um, uh, has hurt things. Now, the start of construction language that came at the end of 2012 is really going to push a big market in 2014 and into 2015. Uh, but what it's caused a company like General Electric to do is to actually look overseas. Mm -hmm. And that ha it's been a blessing and a curse. There are kind of stable policy regimes that we think in Western Europe, Northern Europe, to a lesser extent in the southern part of Europe anymore, some of these other places. Eastern Europe, uh, a mixed bag. But for the emerging markets, what we're seeing is a push for what we call localization, which is it's, it's, a, it's a difficult position for manufacturers, global manufacturers to be in because essentially, as you understand, what the emerging markets want is investment in country for manufacturing. And that doesn't always make sense for a variety of reasons. Size of the market, cost of doing business in a place, maybe the regulatory structures. And so um, GE likes to do what we call global supply chain. We like to be able to source, um, um, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in China, India, wherever that be, um, to bring costs down. And sometimes that's difficult. We have made a, local, a, a major localization investment in a country like Brazil mm -hmm. because we see a, long, a, a more long-term sustainable market and a more stable policy regime. But even that comes with its drawbacks, as we see Brazil does auctions. And as you all know, that's intended to push the price down. The cost of localization is up, and so you hope that you never get to that place where you're flipped. And I think there was some concern about three or four months ago that that might have been the case. The last couple of auctions, the price has come back up and everyone's breathed again. But I would say that those are the things that um, we look for as we look to move outside the United States, where I think next year um, about 50% of our revenue will come from outside the United States. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this next question uh, is geared towards Jonathan here. Uh, you're familiar, uh, m many of you would be, uh, the President's All of the Above Energy Strategy, basically calling for um, a comprehensive policy in the development of alternatives on renewables, uh, energy efficient technologies, as well as domestic oil and gas production. Um, however, many are saying these days that 
the low cost and abundant supply of natural gas, for example, is pretty much offsetting uh, the transition to renewable sources, both in the U.S. as well as internationally. How do we create um, a policy that can promote an alternative energy source, such as natural gas, for example, without um, undermining the transition to renewables, um, as well as trying to keep the cost low for consumers, um, basically having that affordability? Thanks very much. I, I think that there's a couple of parameters and contexts that one has to think about when you think about any energy policy. I think the way we in the administration are thinking about it is that thus this is not one solution. It's not a question of saying natural gas is the answer for everybody in every case at every point in time. Rather what you say is that there are a variety of different choices and they fill different market niches. And what we really want to do is have certain parameters to our energy infrastructure and our energy system that we appreciate. And you can list them fairly simply. There's actually widespread agreement, I would argue, in the United States over these parameters. So what do they include? They include that the energy system has to work. It has to provide for transport. It has to provide for light and for heat and for motive power. And if it doesn't, it's not doing its job. It doesn't matter if you have a fabulous source that's perfect in some dimension and it doesn't do the reliability side. It's got to be clean. It's got to increasingly be cleaner than it ever used to be. We've got a commitment as a nation to clean up our energy system. And that means every part of it. Dennis put on the screen a little while ago some of the direct impacts. You see the air quality ones. Those are quite immediate. We've had Clean Air Act standards in place for decades. We insist as a nation that our supply has to be clean. and You've got to be able to breathe the air. It's not good to have energy where the lights go on, but you can't walk through the city. It has to also be clean in a longer dimension. It's got to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. And increasingly, we're focusing on that particular question because unless you do, it doesn't matter whether your supply is cheap and reliable, it's creating global problems. So there's a series of parameters that meet those tests. We'd also like it to be available locally. And by locally, I mean somewhere in the United States, and sometimes we even mean even more locally than that. And we have individual states that think about their parameterization in a much more local context. And that's driven a whole host of different outcomes. So in some cases where we have low-cost coal, that becomes an option, and we worry about its emissions. And so we've set in motion a series of standards which go back decades to control the air quality, and increasingly now with our new source standards that the EPA has put forward to control climate change. And that sets you in a gas motion. What happens in gas? We found massive new developments of gas. Why? In no small measure, because 25 years ago, 30 years ago now, the Department of Energy invested hugely in directional drilling which meant that from a single pad, you could go down and find gas in multiple places with new technology. So a long-term investment is part of that solution. And we have massive renewables. And I mean across the board. Some of the early investments made by the DOE laboratories, by private sector actors, have fundamentally altered the pathway. The Chinese found a way to market it at low cost, but it's often American technology derived here decades ago that drives it. So how does that fit into all the above? It means you have to have characteristics, and there's no one size that fits all. And our objective is to find the ways that you meet the demand that we require nationally and globally, meeting local requirements as well as international requirements that meets those characteristics, and there is a home for every part of that energy system. Let's be very clear. The United States is not going to move away from fossil fuels in the next couple of years. It won't happen. In that context, we have to figure out how to make it work and the world equally is not moving away. China is heavily based on coal. So is India, increasingly South Africa. You start looking at the availability, it meets the security needs of nations. The gas reserves that we find in the United States are matched by gas reserves in the Asian continent and, in fact, in Europe. How do you think about using those to your economic benefit? That's part of the puzzle while meeting this other part about those characteristics. Thank you very much. Um, JC, you alluded to this earlier. Um, there's been a lot of attention given to the idea of crowdsourcing clean energy technologies as communities uh, take matters into their own hands. Is this a viable method of clean energy financing, and do you think it would take hold? And also, Todd, please, if you would like to elaborate on that as well. I, th I think it's an interesting concept. Um, to be honest, when we do um, volume cases and projections, it's not something we think about. Mm -hmm. um, because. Maybe it would get someday drive a market. Um, I'm just not sure in the near term that it would. And so when we look at 
um, doing volume cases, let's take the United States for example. We look at unmet RPS demand, we look at um, the production tax credit, we look at the um, can we in certain places beat the avoided cost of gas as Todd alluded to in a lot of places mm -hmm. where the wind blows at a steady enough rate, you know, who would have ever thought we would see um, PPAs at $20 a megawatt hour for wind mm -hmm. and we're seeing that in some places and so um, that would be more what we look at um, as opposed to um, the crowdsourcing, which I'm sure is a, an idea that in some places works. Um, I'm, it's just not something that as a company we look at as driving a market in the near term. Okay. Yeah, I, would, I would just add that um, there, you know, the, the capital markets are, you know, in the U.S. and around the world around energy are quite robust. Mm -hmm. uh, but the key point here is the policy signal on, you know, on, on where and how and so on to invest that capital. And that's, I think, where we've had a number of issues, especially around renewable energy, because the policy has been quite uncertain for a number of years. And again, think about the tax credits here in the U.S., the boom and bust, stop and start element to that. It's very much, uh, I think, thwarted uh, some significant amendment, momentum in the market. And, and even despite that, we made tremendous progress. But we're still, as I mentioned earlier, we're still at the early phase of, of deploying these technologies. I think in the U.S., the non-hydro renewable energy uh, contribution is about 5%. Now, that's, it's growing fast, but when we think about getting to the level here in the U.S. and elsewhere that's possible, that's even economic, it's going to be huge, we're going to need huge, uh, uh, much larger sources of, of private capital to get there, and the policy signal is really key. Um, when we think about the policy signal, and if, leading, to the, leading to the question you asked Jonathan about what we need, I think it, we do need a long-term strategy. We need, we need to send to the, to the market a long-term visibility. We also need to think about you know, the incentive side, and I think that uh, there's some room for innovation on that front because the, the current policies have worked. We've, we've made huge progress, but now we're, we think we're capable of taking it to the next level. And when you think about that too, it's the regulatory framework that is really key. When we think about it, it's the power market structure. You know, what are we competing against? Is that field level? Uh, you know, uh, as we say, uh, Thomas Edison, who designed our power system more than 100 years ago, would fully recognize today's power system is still fundamentally the same. With the advent of all kinds of new technology, whether it's renewables, uh, smart grid technology, all that kind of thing, we're really now entering a, an area where we could uh, you know, really transform things. Think of cell phones, as we all, you know, we all talk about that a lot, but that's not that in some ways that analogy is, is appropriate, other ways maybe not. But certainly uh, as we uh, can deploy systems at the distributed level and so on, but the, mass, the capital is gonna be key here um, the, uh, there, are, there, is, there is some legislation that's been introduced in Congress that, that uh, applies to the conventional energy industry that would, you know, would motivate large amounts of capital, even for renewables, if it could qualify. You know, that's important. The regulatory framework, the playing field, will send a long-term uh, policy signal to the market as well. So uh, the, these uh, the, the policies is core to energy. Uh, it's, fu it, it's, it's not about the free market. The, it, we're, policy sets the playing field in which the free market works, people compete. We do need to adjust that uh, relative to the development of a whole host of new products and services and technologies. Just to add, in addition to those policy, are there any regulatory reforms you think that could help um, in trying to spur that investment of, of renewables, for example? We're, we're, we're making an investment internally in you know chasing 111B and to a, a, a larger extent 111D and what that's gonna look like from a renewables perspective. So I think there are policy um, regulatory frameworks that can help set a market. Now, mm -hmm. the size of that market, I think, is open to debate and discussion and kind of depends on the age-old debate inside defense versus system-wide and what, the, what that regulatory framework looks like. But it is something that we're watching and that we're engaging in the debate. Great. Jonathan, uh, globally, electricity uh, generation will lead uh, demand and energy growth. So followed by the industrial and transportary transportation sectors. Um, you have the, also the growth in CO2 emissions, um, and this is primarily coming from developing countries. How do we balance our priority of expanding energy access for the 1.3 billion people without electricity with our goals of trying to transform energy production and curbing the emissions and meeting those climate change targets? Thanks very much. I, I think a lot of people, just to follow up one point, a uh, comment that was just made, for people who don't know what 111B and D are, those oh. are two sub-elements of the Clean Air Act. Sorry. They're now yes. up for revision. Uh, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is contemplating changing some of those standards to incorporate CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. 
it is a major component of the policy that the President announced as part of the Climate Action Plan in a speech he made last uh, June, and it's now underway. And I think I very much would agree it's the kind of thing which will shape expectations for the investment community. Mm. And I would put, the reason I, I wanted to go back to it is that to a certain extent it helps answer the question, Julia, that you've just asked. Very largely, it's a function of what countries want to do. It is not clear that you need to have substantially higher costs to have lower CO2. It mostly depends what you count. If you believe that the consequences of climate change actually lead to damages, which the entire scientific community believes, then if you don't count those damages, you are under-costing the price. If you take what the cost of coal is without capture and storage, unless it's being cleaned up, and you don't count air quality, and you're in China, you're not valuing the price. It doesn't mean that it has to cost you more to do that. It means you have to think about where the burden is held. And developing countries, as developed countries, can do that. And we are seeing when they do do that, the benefits accrue to the society. It does not mean that for all countries, the capacity is available. And if you take a look at something called the Sustainable Energy for All program, that was launched a couple of years back in the United States as an initial partner in that exercise. Carlos Pascual, who's here at the department who runs the Energy and Natural Resources program here, is on the board of that particular group. Our own secretary at the Department of Energy is actively involved in that exercise, has several objectives. One, provide access to everybody, and we have a huge number who don't have it. Two, to double the efficiency around the world's energy supply. And three, to double the renewable capacity that we've got globally. And these are goals that we think can be reached at relatively modest economic cost and then return on the economy, economics in the longer term. And we can help. We as a nation can help. We have the AID programs. We have the overseas private investment programs. We have the export-import bank programs. We have the programs of the private sector where investments return actual good returns on those investments. All of that's possible and gives us an outcome and can be done with low CO2 emissions and a much better economic welfare. Thank you. One final question, and then we'll be able to open up to the audience uh, for Q's and A's. Uh, Todd and JC, um, one of the key components of State Department's energy policy is the promotion of stable, uh, growing global markets for the entry of U.S. energy firms. How, do the, how does the government, how do we overall, how can we best provide um, support and information to companies internationally even seeking to work in developing energy companies? Is there anything that we could do to be more supportive? I, I think uh, uh, the, you know, in renewables and as, as, as is the case in other energy technology areas, uh, you know, we're talking about global markets and we're talking about global industries and global businesses. I think there's much that can be shared uh, across the, the globe that can help uh, promote uh, continued investment and deployment across, across the, the world in areas especially where that makes sense, of course. So, so I think what the State Department can do, and I remember talking with uh, Ambassador Pasquale about this uh, when he just uh, started over here at State. Uh, you know, there are a number of, uh, we have a number of good examples of how the policy framework can work here in the U.S. There are a number of great cases around the world, including, you know, Germany and Europe and other places. To share these best practices and lessons learned, I think, is a huge uh, advantage. And I think, uh, especially as, as countries look to diversify their energy sources, you know, they can uh, skip a few, uh, uh, you know, uh, steps along the way of, of learning and take on board what, uh, what is working elsewhere. And I think that would be uh, tremendously helpful. Uh, it, the, again, most of the, the, the companies are global. It's a global market, a global industry. Mm -hmm. And the technologies you have, especially in the renewable space, broad application from you know, uh, think of big, you know, wind farms, of course, and, power, and solar power plants to, you know, putting solar on your roof. I remember in a, before I joined ACOR, I was uh, with a company when we developed some off-grid systems in the Philippines and, 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 in, uh, and in Vietnam to bring, you know, the first modern power to um, these very remote villages, uh, difficult to reach, but, uh, but solar was a huge enabler uh, to, to uh, provide lighting, ref basic refrigeration, and other basic needs. So I think these technologies have broad application, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's helpful that we share these best practices and then figure out how to get it to, to the people who need these things. I, I think from a manufacturer's perspective, one of the ways is um, market intelligence. Um, and and mm -hmm. without naming countries, two practical example, uh, another kind of advocacy oriented, although not commerce, but that we have used through embassies is um, stability of markets. And the US government is able to, in some places um, communicate to foreign governments that certain policy decisions or 
um, retroactive decisions hurt foreign direct investment. And mm -hmm. in any emerging market, foreign direct investment is the lifeblood. And so um, embassies play an important role in being able to communicate that message. And, and I can think off the top of my head of two specific examples that we're working right now where that message is being communicated through embassies. Great. Thank you. Um, I, we have time for just a couple questions. Five minutes. Okay, great. Any, anybody from the audience? Don't be shy. <laughs> yes, please. Absolutely. Want to address it? Thanks very much. I, I think that the fact we didn't speak to it is probably a, an error on our parts because I think you're quite correct about the scale and the potential that it has to bring to the table. I'm struck in the U.S. context about the variety of different models and scenarios that people have run into the future. The Energy Information Administration, for example, has done a series of cases in which they look at ways to reduce greenhouse gases and try to project forward to 2020 or now 2025 or even 2030. And as you say, a substantial share comes in the form of energy efficiency. The International Energy Agency, based in Paris, has the same kind of models. Earlier this week, the International Energy Agency released a brand new report looking at 11 countries in the OECD in terms of their efficiency gains and benefits. And that report demonstrates that, in fact, the savings, if you add up the savings, I think since 1990 is the base year that they use, running through 2010, the equivalent saved, if you were to determine it in oil terms, so say how much it would be in barrels of oil, is the amount in those 11 countries only that the U.S. consumes on an annual basis. That's the savings that we've already achieved, and I think most people would think we've only just begun to scratch the surface of what's globally possible. That doesn't include savings in, in Eastern Europe, doesn't include savings in China, doesn't include savings as we see economies developing without a focus on efficiency that they could have. But I would take one more point. We've actually not done as well as we'd like to do on the policy side. You take a look at the difficulty in figuring out exactly what's the policy that drives efficiency. Well, it's partly regulatory. Things like a refrigerator, things like an automobile, things that you deal with uh, in terms of industrial motors, those are all things on which we've got policies and they seem to do a good job, but it's hard to move them forward. A price, that'd be fabulous. If you could put a price in place, you could really end up driving people to a more rational behavior where the value of energy would really be turned into efficiency gains. But that's also very hard. Think about raising the taxes in any of our countries that any of you guys work in, very, very difficult politically to do. So we've got real potential, but we've also got real hurdles that we have to overcome to reach that potential. Thanks. Yes. So I think it's a really good question to think about where exemptions apply and when they get used and, and how you think about them going forward. At the moment, the natural gas price has been hovering between 3 and $4 in OMTCF. So that's the current price. Uh, when I began working in the States, and I spent a number of years doing some work in the, in the Northeast region uh, before I joined the State Department at the beginning of the Obama administration, when I began working with the States, we were thinking about a regional cap and trade program in the northeastern part of the country. At that point, we thought we could really, if we were really lucky, we could squeeze a few percentage points reductions because gas was hovering at between $13 and $14 in OMTCF. At that price, coal was unbelievably attractive. And we were looking at moving coal power in from Pennsylvania, moving it in from New Jersey, and we couldn't move on the politics. So now it's come down a lot. And the question is, what's driven it down? I think it's been driven down by the new technologies. I think your fracking model is exactly right. 
I think that increasingly we're seeing states themselves push back around the quality of the air and the water, and increasingly in places like North Dakota, some of you may have seen a statement that the state of North Dakota was proposing to, proposing to sue some of the companies because the gas being flared was lost royalties for state coffers. So here you're seeing a very interesting evolution of the model for how it's developed. Do you think you need exemptions? I think it's an open question. Do we benefit from the gas? I think that's very clear that we do. Are there ways you can continue to benefit going forward and continue to maintain the environmental quality that we all desire? I think that's the place we're currently grappling. So I think it's a, a very nuanced set of issues. One last question. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Was, was that a was there a question though, or just a com or just a general comment? Oh, okay. Please, George. So I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, these guys probably have some other thoughts about it. I've been doing a fair amount of work over the last uh, number of years now in the Middle East, and I use them as an example because I, th I think there's actually a really interesting story that's being told here. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates. Dubai, you see here a whole series of countries around the world thinking about big oil export potential. Saudi Arabia is a very good case in point. The current projection suggests that Saudi Arabia, which has historically been the largest global producer and exporter, uh, is going to be consuming more than 70 and by the year 2030, perhaps as much as 90% of all of its oil at home. Now you think about an economy in which that's the case, and you think about what their structure looks like when they no longer have this export value. And then you think about the costs of the alternatives. They can sell oil on the global market today. It's going to take about $105 a barrel. The equivalent price for some combination of renewables, maybe it's a bit of nuclear power, maybe it's a variety of other alternatives like efficiency, can get you anywhere from, say, $25 to $30 a barrel of equivalent, which means if you do those things and you sell your oil, you've got $70 of profit on every barrel above and beyond what you've done at home. That makes for a remarkably interesting economic discussion. And what are they doing? They've just put in place the single largest single purchase order for solar power, 40 gigawatts. I don't know if they can meet that number. It's a staggeringly large number. I don't know if they really can. But the fact that they put it out there suggests a completely new paradigm. And if the price continues to come down, and I'm kind of here where, where Todd is and JC are, I think that the models are really moving us down those cost curves for all of these options. There's a remarkably interesting story, not just for the Middle East, but for a great deal of the rest of the world as well. Low cost alternatives, significant benefits on the climate side, and revenues that can be saved against global market purchases, which you'd otherwise have to incur. I would just add, and we, to reinforce what Jonathan just said, we're seeing significant investment growth in renewables in Asia and the Middle East. Uh, in fact, Asia is now, uh, it grew about 16% over the last year, where it's declined elsewhere around the world for a lot of reasons. But so the, the deployment opportunity for Asia is, is quite significant. As I mentioned earlier, and Jonathan just reinforced himself, is the cost reduction is changing, I think, the, the playing field here entirely. So that would be a very smart decision to, to, to pursue this kind of you know, more diverse approach. And I, I would just add that you know, we're, when we talk about uh, the, the ability to impact you know, for scale, um, I, I'm reminded again the fact here in the US, uh, you know, in 2012, more than 49% of all new power added, capacity added in the United States came from renewable energy. That's massive. It surpassed all other sources, including natural gas. In Europe, it, in, in the EU, it's 70% renewable energy, new capacity. So I think not only in the Middle East, but you know, what's happening here and, and the cumulative impact of all that, I think presents a huge opportunity for countries all over, even if they are very wealthy, fortunate to have the, uh, the, uh, the, the conventional uh, sources, that they can diversify and, and actually strengthen their position by also investing in renewables. I just think, to, to put a fine point on it, when, when we look at things, we look at you know, three things essentially, we look at global markets, stable demand with some growth, um, policy stability, and 
essentially do the economics work. And we say to the economics work, can we spend our money to better returns in other places? And I think in that brings in a whole host of things. As, as Dr. Pershing mentioned earlier, it, XM, you know, can we bring XM to the table? And what does that mean for sourcing? Because we have to source so much of the content in the United States. You know, so we look at all those things, and it really does come down to, you know, in China, there's the, the market is full of cheap competitors. So does GE fare well in that, or how do we compete in that? Or, you know, in Vietnam or some of these other countries. And so we're, we're actively chasing deals. We've done deals in those places, but it really is for us at the end of the day. It's an economically driven decision. Can we get the margins that we look for with our investment of capital in a given market, or can we do better somewhere else? So that's kind of what it, how it boils down. Great, great. Thank you very much. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to meet the panelists offline, too, as well. So I encourage you all to ask further questions if need be. I think we uh, will go ahead and move to a, a short break. Or Okay, great. Um, again, thank you all very much and uh, look forward to talking to you further. <laughs>